This is KGW News at Noon. Good afternoon, I'm Drew Carney. Welcome to today's News at Noon. Our top story this afternoon is Oregon's legislative walkout, which is now the longest in state history. And lawmakers who don't show up to work at this point will now be fined hundreds of dollars a day. But that doesn't seem to be getting Republican senators back to work any faster. Last week, Senate President Rob Wagner announced that starting this week, senators will get hit with a $325 fine for every day that they're not present. Most Republican senators haven't shown up in Salem in over a month since May the 3rd. They're upset about bills involving gender affirming care, abortion and guns. Democrats have said they're not willing to give up on those bills. Wagner says Oregon voters want them. This morning, a group of Democrats held a press conference demanding that their Republican counterparts come back to work. Oregonians voted to codify Roe v. Wade and abortion rights after the Dobbs decision. Not for just some of us, but for all of us. And Senate Republicans are showing now, through their obstructionist tactics, that they would rather shut down the basic functioning of our government than let us vote to secure our fundamental reproductive freedoms. Republicans are calling the bills they're against hyperpartisan and unconstitutional, and they say they won't come back to work until the last day of the session, which is June 25th. Little history here. Democrats also tried to find Republicans during a walkout in 2019, but never collected those fines after Republicans threatened to sue. Each of the senators who walked out has also passed the threshold established by Oregon's new measure 113. So under that new law, any legislator who has 10 or more unexcused absences will not be allowed to run for reelection. Although that measure is certain to face legal challenges as well. All right, a lot to cover off the top there, Rod. We'll have more news headlines here in a moment, but we do want to check in with you because weather is a big part of our Tuesday noon show. Yeah, it's been a nice uh, morning. We've been comfortable. That's going to change. I think in the coming hours, a uh, couple of hours, we could warm up a rapid 10 degrees and then keep adding once we get to the 3 and 4 o'clock hour this afternoon. Uh, everybody is clear right now for the most part. It's Cannon Beach. You see some folks out there. Tide is out. The Pacific water is blue. Uh, temperature here at the, the noon hour, 61 degrees. Beach temperatures for the most part are going to end. Whoa, hold on, hold on. Let me walk off screen. For some reason, my computer jumped on me. My apologies. What I'm trying to get to is simply this camera view, which shows you the sunshine from the Wells Fargo building. 77 is our lunchtime temperature. I mentioned we could easily add 10 degrees between now and the 2 o'clock hour. That would get us up to about 87 and then keep adding degrees up into the 90s. All the weather models that came out this morning still insist that we at least get into the low 90s this afternoon, becoming the sixth 90 degree day of 2023 so far. We'll go 93 at four and still well up into the 80s at eight o'clock. Um, still looking at potential 90s tomorrow. I am tracking cooler weather after that, and we'll have that complete forecast coming up for you. And by the way, real quick, winds have been pretty quiet out there. Not the windy day that we had yesterday. That's good news. Back to you. Your computer is too athletic, Rod. It's very jumpy. <laughs> very jumpy. <laughs> we'll have more with Rod coming up here in just a few minutes. Right now, we want to get back to our news headlines this afternoon. Federal law enforcement agencies are now investigating former Oregon Secretary of State Shamia Fagan. According to the Oregonian, they're looking into her side job with the cannabis company Lamoda. Fagan resigned as Secretary of State on May 2nd after news broke that she was working with LaModa. So the scope of the federal investigation is not clear yet, but it's in addition to separate investigations by the State Ethics Commission and the Oregon Department of Justice. For the first time in seven years, people in Multnomah County can apply for what are called Section 8 housing vouchers. It's a form of federal rent assistance designed to help people who make at or below 50% of the area's median income. In Multnomah County, the median income is $39,000 for an individual and $56,000 for a family of four. Back in 2017, Multnomah County stopped handing out these vouchers because they didn't have enough funding. But the federal government just announced that the entire state of Oregon is getting an additional $1 million for the Section 8 vouchers program. There's definitely plenty more work to do up top for us to be able to create more housing opportunities for our neighbors out on the streets. I have to take care of myself now. I can't worry about five, seven, eight years down the road. I have to worry about now. I need a place today. So the process involves a random lottery and only 2,000 people who apply this year will be picked for the program. 
At that point, their names only go on a wait list and it could actually take up to three years before they get a voucher. The deadline to apply is this Friday. Portland police are trying to squash rumors of a potential serial killer in the metro area. After six different cases of local women who all went missing and were later found dead occurred here over the last several months. As KGW's Mike Benner reports, detectives say they do not believe that those six cases are connected. We're back with new fears of a possible serial killer in Oregon. The national media is now reporting on the deaths of six women across our region. These women between the ages of 22 and 32 have all turned up dead in the last four months. One of the victims, Bridget Webster, was found as far south as Polk County. Another, Joanna Speaks, up in northern Clark County. But the bodies of the other women were discovered in and around Portland. Detectives have ruled out foul play in the death of one of the women found in a tent along southeast Flavel. But foul play has not been ruled out in the other five cases. While the Portland Police Bureau's position is that these death investigations are not connected, at least as of right now, detectives with the Bureau are talking with investigators at the Clackamas, Polk and Clark County Sheriff's offices. One of the main things that they're going to be looking at is the manner of death and the weapon. Brianna Fox is a former FBI special agent and current professor in the Department of Criminology at the University of South Florida. She says in addition to the manner of death and weapon, detectives from the various agencies will be looking at possible connections between the victims themselves, as well as forensic evidence gathered at the scenes. I'm sure what police are trying to do right now is pool evidence across multiple scenes. If they find um, two pieces of DNA, let's say two separate scenes or on two separate victims and they match the same person, then you pretty much know you have a serial killer. At this point, that remains a mystery. What is clear is the fact that a handful of women are dead under suspicious circumstances and a region is on edge. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Meanwhile, new court documents show that sheriff's deputies were scheduled to remove a man from his southwest Portland apartment the same day that he's accused of setting the apartment building on fire. Garrett Rep was in court yesterday. A grand jury indicted him on 55 counts, including arson and reckless endangerment. The fire happened last month at the May apartments on southwest 14th and Taylor. Records show Rep was still living in the apartment, even though he was convicted or evicted, pardon me. Investigators say a specially trained dog found several samples of potential accelerant in Rep's apartment. Nick Gomez also lived there. He was among the 16 tenants who were home when that fire started. He's been living in a hotel since that time, but says he is getting close to getting some permanent housing. I hope to resettle and acclimate very quickly. Like I just want to, I just want this chapter be, to be over with. Garrett Rep remains in jail. His next court date is set for June 23rd. A group of Providence nurses have voted to authorize strikes. The nurses work at facilities in Portland and Seaside and home health and hospice. The nurses list of concerns include patient care, unsafe staffing levels and inadequate wage and benefit packages. Providence says it's disappointed in the strike vote. The union says negotiations are still going on and will give Providence a 10 day heads up if and when it calls for a strike. A Vancouver family is fighting to bring back their mom, bring her back home after she had a medical emergency while vacationing in Portugal. She's in a coma and her family says it'll cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to fly her back to Washington. Diana James suffered a subdural hematoma the day after she arrived there in Portugal. Her two children flew out to be with her and now they're warning others that Travel medical insurance could have actually covered these expenses. If you are traveling abroad, the first thing you want to do is get in touch with your health insurance provider, explain to them where you're going, you know, what country you're visiting and ask whether you will be covered. If you are not covered, it is a really good idea to invest in travel medical insurance. AAA says that health insurance plans typically provide coverage while traveling within the U.S but not when traveling internationally.